Welcome. Uh, we are continuing with this uh, topic where we are going through the things that we meditated on during our 40-day fast. And uh, these things that we were meditating on are to be able to help us because we need to lay a foundation of what is it all about. Is this the only life that we're going to live? And so if you know God and you believe in him, you know that this is not that life. This is just a preparation of the life that you're going to live with him for eternity. But for him, for him, why didn't he just take you the moment that you believed in him? Because you have a destiny, you have a purpose. You are his arms and, and hands to be able to advance his kingdom here on the earth. And so that's where we are, where we are looking at some of the things that really would help us uh, be able to advance his kingdom. And we say it, it is not just advancing his kingdom on Sunday morning. When we look at the fivefold gifts, fivefold ministry, the offices in the book of uh, Ephesians 4.11, you know, we have the apostolic office, uh, we have the pastor, we have the, the teacher, the prophet, the evangelist, and, and uh, yeah, so I just mix them up. And so we have those five offices. And so what the Bible says is th it's for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So those apostles, whatever the apostolic uh, uh, gifting is, is uh, office. Now, when somebody occupies that office, mostly what they do is they see the bigger picture, but they also help start up things. And so that where they are able to see the whole picture, all that they are equipping the by seeing that they are equipping the saints on maybe how to see the bigger picture. The prophets, they are able to hear God and they work hard and hard with the apostles to be able to hear the voice of God, but also equipping the saints to be able to not just move without hearing God. And so how do they proceed when they are still hearing God? Then we look at... Um, the teacher. So the teacher's assignment is to be able to break down the word into little bites that people can understand. And so they take the whole picture and, and uh, the whole maybe the word and they're able to break it down, you know, and build precept upon precept for some people to understand. Then we look at the pastor, the, uh, the, the, uh, the evangelist. The evangelist's assignment is to be able to, um, they have a an, an anointing from God uh, to be able to remember they're also equipping the saints. The, the, most of the people, when it comes to somebody like eva the evangelist, they most of the time they are the ones now doing the work of the ministry. Yes, you can equip when you're when you're in practice, but most of the time. If you occupy the op office of the evangelist, what you should be remembering is your work is to equip the saints. So maybe teach them and, 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 and trust that you can also impart that gift upon them for them to go and win souls. And, and so winning new souls to, to Christ. Because this, this, if the church does not have new souls coming in, then the church is not going to uh, grow and this a revelation of God that is going to be hidden. I don't have time to go to that, but that's what Jesus was telling Peter because when he said, do you love me? And he said, you know, feed my, feed, feed my lamb. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Shepherd my sheep. And so there's that where it's though there are prayer of words. When you are feeding the lamb, the newborn babies, they are so hungry and there's uh, somewhere where you understand the love of God from being able to to see that. And so let's go. So that's the evangelist. They are able to train other people. And then when we're looking at the pastor, the pastor is like the shepherd. Actually, the pastor or, or name is used so few times, but we see the word shepherd. And so he's shepherding, he's, you know, bringing the, the sheep together so that they can eat, feed and, and feed together and also know, help knowledge nourish each other or be in an environment where they can be nourished but still it is for the equipping of the saints and so we see those those uh those offices are actually moving moving together and so in that it's where we were saying then now you need to be able to hear god because all these saints are be, that are being equipped they are not gonna be serving on sunday yes on sunday you come and serve in your church but that's not your main assignment 
your main assignment is Monday through, you know, for some most people, it is Monday through, through Saturday because majority of the people we know that uh, only 1% is in full-time ministry. So everybody else is stepping out into this. We call them the seven spheres of influence. And so you need to know what of those spheres you, you fit in and you can be in more than one. And so once you're equipped, you come to church to be equipped so that you can actually uh, carry out God's influence uh, in your marketplace, in where you step out on Monday morning so that his kingdom can advance in every sphere of the society. And so we are here where we are looking at seeking, uh, desiring to hear God's voice. And so um, we were looking at seeking wisdom and then we desire to hear God's voice. And so we said there is the spiritual intelligence where we get intelligence that is not from the earth. That is the God's wisdom. And that's what we, sh we put into application. And then uh, when we hear God's voice, we say it, it comes, if you, it, it, I, I want to encourage you to take time and meditate on God's voice. Because when we say that, uh, you know, desire to prophesy, uh, most people get it as desire to just get information from God. They forget the part that that information comes with a grace, with an enablement, with power. It doesn't just come by itself. It comes with a way that once you believe it, it has the capability of changing the circumstances and the situation. And so that's the capability that we are looking, we were looking at with Jehoshaphat, where it, it does not make sense for a whole army to send worshippers ahead. But because that's the way that, you know, we say Judah went first all the time. Judah is praised. And so that's how the structure was that time. It does not make sense for Gideon to go with 300 people when he had a possibility of 32,000. That does not, that is not, um, you know, natural intelligence. Natural intelligence or the wisdom of this world would say the more people you have, the more victorious you are going to become. But God understood there's a concept here. If they, these 300 people, they are united. And, you know, some of the ones that left were the ones who had fear. And so there's a time if Gideon would have carried so many people, but half of them have fear. And so we saw that fear paralyzes. And so he could have been defeated because they had fear. Others didn't know how to, to you know, to, to drink as they are watching. And so they were not able to, to do, uh, to, you know, multitask, drink, uh, you know, they are nourishing themselves as they are watching. And so God said, no, those, those are not the ones. No, they are the ones that were able to, to, to actually drink while they are watching are the only ones he was sent with. And so he, he won the battle with the 300. Gideon's 300 does not make any sense. David's, you know, string that even David describing how it's going to come and hit that Goliath and he's going to take his sword and cut his head. That does not make sense how he is going to uh, de uh, defeat the enemy. But he had wisdom from above. He had been spending time from, uh, from, uh, with God and he knew his God. And those who know their God, they shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And so do you know your God or do you just, you know, have information about him, but you don't know him? Are you able to take a stand uh, concerning your God? And so that's why we need to really hear his voice. And it also comes with believing because the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice and a voice of a stranger they do not follow. And so God's sheep are able to hear his voice. They don't follow the voice of a stranger. You are God's sheep if you belong to his household. So trust that God is going to speak to you. Have faith. Speak to yourself and, and declare that. Don't decree something that is contrary to what it is God says. Uh, you know, the other day, God, we were making decrees, and God was saying, we are our worst, most worst, we are our worst enemy. The person who defeats us most is us. It's us who defeat ourselves the most because it, if we say the things we say about ourselves or we think about ourselves to another person, some of us, 
th those people would not be their friend. And so now it's the same thing. You treat yourself as the prized possession of God. And so you start saying the same thing as the word says about you. It says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You declare that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If it says that his sheep hear his voice and a voice of a stranger they do not follow, they know him. It says they know the, the voice of their shepherd. You know, most people say that in the Middle East, how they led the sheep is the, the shepherd would go ahead of the sheep and he would be calling them. And so they are in this place where the, all these sheep are grazing. But when the, the shepherd calls his sheep, his sheep know to follow him wherever he's going. Jesus is our shepherd and he wants us to follow us. He doesn't want to coerce us to follow him. He wants us to follow him out of a pure heart. And so are you going to follow him or have you been following him the way he wants you to follow him or you've been following him the way you want to follow him without really fully knowing him so that you don't follow him all the way. So get to know him. And I said one way is meditating and spending time in the word. Spend time, spend time, spend time in the word. I can't say it enough because if you spend time in the word, meditating on it, then you get to know the voice of your shepherd and you'll be able to follow him and he'll be, be victorious in every area. Then um, then we, we, talked, we looked at uh, nurturing divine connections and life-giving relationships. And in this, we went in the Bible, and there's so many divine connections. Let's talk about Paul and Barnabas. So Paul has had this divine encounter with God on the road to Emmaus. Uh, and then once he had, uh, on the road to Damascus. And so once he has, uh, once he has had these divine encounters, uh, divine encounter with God in Acts 9, he goes and, and, and for three days he's bright and then uh, Ananias is sent to pray for him, scales fall off his eyes and now he's ready to serve God. But the apostles were not ready to receive him because they only knew him as the Paul who used to terrorize them and more of the terrorist Paul. And so it is Barnabas. Barnabas means the son of encouragement and it is Barnabas who took Paul and because he had he himself had a reputation, he believed in Paul and he went and he took him to the apostles and they were able to hear him and you know receive him. And sometimes we need those people that actually go ahead, but that's not the, the where their relationship ended. Because also later when Barnabas is the one who suggested that they need to go to Antioch. And so he paved the way because he had already established his relationship. He paved the way for Paul to, to keep stepping out and going and, and being, you know, nurturing him and being there with him as he's going, growing in the Lord. And so we see Barnabas accompanying him. And I believe that he made Paul, he, 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 he had a, a great impact in Paul's life. And, but we see that relationship was not nurtured all the way because when they had issues with John Mark, they, 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 had, they exchanged bitter words and they decided to go separately. And so Paul went with Titus and, and, and Barnabas went with, with John Mark. But later we see that Paul is, is talking about John Mark and saying that he needs to receive, he wants to receive him. And so we see that Paul forgot the same way that he was converted and nobody would believe in him. He had not matured yet as a, as a Christian, but Barnabas took him. But when Barnabas now was giving grace to somebody else who had not matured, Paul, uh, Paul got upset about that uh, because uh, John Mark had been afraid and abandoned them before. And so they separated. I don't think that's how God intended for that relationship to end, but that's how it ended. There's some people that God is going to bring into your life that are further ahead from you 
than others. And so with those that are further ahead, we just need to ask God. If they are further ahead, then, then uh, even if some of the relationships might be difficult, we say we pursue peace because they might be life-giving to us. So let's look at uh, other relationships. The relationship between, you know, between, uh, we talked about Abraham and Lot. That relationship, uh, Abraham was supposed to value the relationship between God more than the relationship between Lot. And so he refused to obey God. And that cost Lot his destiny and his purpose because he ended up having children through incest, the, the daughters having children through incest. So I don't believe that uh, uh, Lot's destiny and purpose was actually supposed to be in in uh, in Canaan, it was supposed to be where they were before, and and we see that relationship, you know, becoming shaky and, and not a good relationship. So there are some relationships that you are in, and you very well know from the very beginning, God told you that relationship is not a relationship that you are supposed to be part of. And so I'm asking you, if God has told you this is not a life giving relationship, but you keep holding on to it, it is going to be detrimental to you and so obey God if he says this is not life-giving then you know it is not life-giving these other relationships like Ruth and Naomi that relationship is one of the life-giving relationships because we see uh, Ruth okay uh, Opa and, and Ruth uh, so Naomi uh, has these two sons and and his and her husband and then there was famine so they go to Moab. And so when they go to Moab, all the sons die and the husband die. And so once they die there, then she's, re she's left with the two, two, two uh, wives of, of the son. So Opa and, and, uh, Opa and, Naomi and, and Ruth. And so Opa and Ruth, uh, Op they decide to go back with her. But Opa decides, no, I'm not going to go. But Ruth decides to cling on to that relationship because there's something about Naomi's God. Even if she didn't understand much, there's something about Naomi's God that Ruth liked and, 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 and made, made connection. And she said, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where will go out? You know, that's a, a very powerful covenant relationship. And so with that covenant relationship, she was able to go and then she went and you, we know how she's helping Naomi and, and how Naomi is the one who came up with a strategy on how it is that she was going to get married. And from that relationship, what is powerful about it is how God was able to accelerate Ruth because of Naomi. And then she became the great grandmother of David. And so when we talk about David, we can't talk about him without looking at Naomi. And so there's that where some of the relationships are going to usher you to your destiny. They are divine connections. We call them the destiny helpers. But if you don't nurture them and really see them beyond for just the normal relationship, then you're not able to receive from them. And so you need to be able to receive from them in a different way. Uh, what would have happened if Lot, even if she, he did something wrong, if he had understood who Abraham is with God and be able to, you know, relate with him, not just like an uncle, but somebody who is connected with God, who can be able to help him in his work. There's a way that our family members, we are not able to see them because we grew up with them and we are not able to see them beyond the fresh. The Bible says, no, no man after the fresh. So you are not supposed to see them in the natural. You're supposed to know them after the spirit. But I'm telling you, there's so many people that know many people after the fresh and they are fresh readings, but they don't know them after the spirit. And so I encourage you to know people after the, the, the fresh, uh, the spirit, including your own, uh, your own, you know, brothers and sisters or your own uh, family members. It is so hard for, uh, we see that where a, a pastor will go out there or a minister will go out there. And they will be life-giving. They will bring life. They will change lives. But when they come home, 
the people at home do not know them after the spirit so much because they can see the failures in their flesh. And so because of that, they are limited on what they can receive from them. And so that's where I want to encourage you, know people after the spirit so that even if they are in your own household so that you can receive from them. There's something, Ruth, so in Naomi, what about Esther and Mordecai? That's a powerful relationship because Mordecai, I really like him. Okay, so when Esther's parents died, we don't know what happened. We just know she was an orphan. Mordecai took, took her in, and so she, he brought her up. When Esther became king, it could have been like the light of Mordecai to reveal who he is and say, I'm the one who brought her, so I desire, deserve you know, to be acknowledged. But if he had done that before time, then the purposes of God would not have been fulfilled. And I really like that, that he sold so much into Esther, but he trusted God's timing to be able to reap for whatever he had sown. He didn't make a demand on her when, just when she became the king, the queen. And, so, and then the relationship still continued because it, when it was time for Esther to act, uh, that one where we read in Esther 4, where he sent that statement where he asked her, maybe you have come to the palace for such a time as this, when you are, uh, you, you are the destiny of the whole of Israel rests upon you, Esther. Mordecai understood that the way he had brought her, she was able to fulfill that destiny. Some of us need a voice, even Jesus needed a voice. I know there's so many ways to interpret that. Where Jesus came and told the, the people that were allowed, uh, allowed Jesus, and she say, they said, she said, what his, the, uh, the mother said, whatever he asks you to do, it's when in kind of gratitude, when they had ran out of wine, and she said, whatever he tells you to do it, do it. And he, he said, it is not yet my time. But I'm telling you the mother's instinct. The mother knew it is time. There's something about you that you need a voice that is decreeing what it is, that it's time to step out into your destiny. And because of her faith, where she told them in advance, whatever he tells you to do, that's the wisdom of God. Whatever wisdom of God he gets, whatever spiritual intelligence he gets, and he relays it to you, don't doubt. There's some things that God has told us to do. Like now, uh, two, maybe a day ago, he just told us to start drinking enough water. And I'm thinking, I know people will hear that, but they won't hear it like the voice of God. They are thinking, God, God can't tell me to drink water. And so we, I don't know why he would say that. There's another time, like before COVID, way before COVID, and he told our group to start taking vitamins and exercising and taking care of their physical health. And, and he said that we, some people did it, some people didn't. But we realized that when COVID came, most of the things that he had told us to do, including other spiritual things, like he had told us to be reading Psalms 121, Psalms 91, and to be taking communion every single day. Those were preparations that he, he had seen ahead and he was preparing and he was preparing us. But still, there's people that had some didn't. Uh, on February, Feb last year, I was just remembering, it is last year, February, when he told uh, my, my church to start trading in stock. And I took time to study as much as I can to help them. And some of them actually went to school and studied. Uh, and then during this time, the crisis for COVID, some of them lost their jobs. And so this is the job that they have been doing. But others were actually able to, to participate in the transference of wealth. Because I still remember up to today, when I woke up, I, don't, I didn't last year at such a time as this. I didn't know much about stock trading. And, but God said we need to trade stocks. So I didn't know how you even trade or where you start. And then, uh, I, I, so I, did, I wasn't following on the news about stock, but I woke up this one day. It was March 18th. 
And I woke up and I remember where I was in the house when God told me, tell people to buy stock today. And they were, he was specific. Uh, but tell them to buy Tesla. So I took a picture of it. I didn't say buy, but I said this would be a good day to buy stock because I'm not an advisor. I'm not, uh, you know, telling them you have to buy. So you, they have to do their due diligence. And they bought, and the people that have bought it then, at, they bought it at 360. That day, they are able to see right now, it's probably like in the 4,000s within a year. They've been able to see that increase. And so when you get the wisdom of God, don't limit him. Don't put limits on God. If he's telling you to do something, then he is capable. That voice, that word has its own Straight power to be able to help itself be accomplished as long as you step out and obey even when it does not make sense. But what I'm saying is some people trust to hear God on Sunday morning, but they don't trust to hear God on Monday morning. They don't trust to hear God about where their kids need to go. They don't trust God to hear on where they themselves should be. And so we, we will look at this some other time, but there's so many people that have succeeded because they obeyed God, but there's others that have failed because they didn't obey God all the way. So partial obedience is disobedience. So ask God for the grace to help you obey. God bless you and continue listening to his voice and obeying it. We'll continue from here next time.